Rafa definitely, because yeah. Rafa was Rafa was universally the the manager that nobody wanted, did they? No, yeah. you know, or yeah. or very few people were were dancing for joy when we got Rafa Benitez. Let's be honest, and it it, it did represent a dark a yeah. dark bit of our our history, didn't it? Yeah, I think that there's a, um, the Norwich game, isn't it? When he was caught sort of smiling as Norwich were kind of beating us. I think there's a, there's a moment there. I think a lot, a lot of Evertonians feel that that's the moment that they felt most disconnected from the club in mm. kind of their Everton life. Where Welcome to Toffee TV. I am delighted to say I'm joined by author Evertonian Jim Keogh. Jim, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Pleasure, mate. Pleasure. It should, this should have happened before Christmas, but... Different things have uh, delayed it, but delighted to say uh, you are joining us. So, Happy New Year, mate. Yeah, and to you. <laughs> Let's hope it's a, a Happy New Year for Everton this year as well. <laughs> no more, not not like 2023, it's like a, a lot happier than that. Uh, but obviously, got you on to discuss your latest book. You've already got a couple of books that are out, so make sure you check Jim's books out. They are Everton's Greatest Games. This one I love the title of Highs, Lows and Bakayoko's, the quality title, and the uh, Everton number nines. They're already out there. We've had Jim in the studio a few years ago to discuss. Was it the greatest games one that we discussed? I think it was, yeah. Yeah, we've had Jim in before to talk about that. But his latest book is called Everything You Wanted to Know About Everton. But well, brackets were afraid to ask. Um, so Jim, what was the what was the idea about uh, behind your latest book then? So the idea was to create a book that kind of, as the title suggests, encompasses everything. So it's, um, you know, it's kind of our greatest games, our greatest moments, our greatest players. But um, also to give the full kind of Everton experience, mm. I wanted to include uh, I think the not so good moments. So you've got the, the the relegation fights, the periods of relegation, and um, and also kind of the the darker or the funnier kind of negative side of being Evertonian, so there's the effort in that moment, it's our greatest hate figures, it's our worst players, as long as we're alongside our greatest players, so ho- hopefully the idea is kind of when you've finished it, you've got a fuller understanding of what Everton are, what it is to be an Evertonian, and sort of why we are the way we are as well. How do you go about a book like this? Because obviously Everton have got a huge history, there's lots of things that I'm sure you've had to leave out in there, good and bad. So how do you how do you begin that process going through Everton's history of thinking, yeah, this makes it into the book and this doesn't? Uh, there's obviously like there's, there's stuff that has to go in. So yeah. obviously you've got like the, the lead titles, the FA Cups, uh, the moments of kind of you know that being fantastic in our history. Uh, equally, kind of a lot of it, I, I kind of talk to other Evertonians. So mm-hmm. I, I, go, I go on social media, I talk to Blues that I know, especially with the, the kind of the more modern parts of the club, and just say like you know, for example, who are the the five figures we hate the most. You get your canvas opinion, and it's, you know you very rarely you can't get a consensus. But like you know, you, and you divide that in between. Like obviously, Liverpool players come up in that, so you have your five worst Liverpool players and your five players beyond that. Uh, some of the worst moments, kind of again, you ask people, and it's it's it's, it's a case really of kind of whittling it down. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's about fifty thousand words the book, so there's a lot in there. Yeah. But I am sure I have missed out certain bits i'm sure i've missed out past some people's favorite bits you can't ever get kind of a, a as i said a fuller consensus of what is great what is not great but uh hopefully there's enough in there to kind of give you an idea of kind of whatever now <laughs> to give you that background yeah i mean that is go on give us one of the give us just one name out of like the five most hated the who is in there which well, weirdly it depends on age. That's a weird thing. So, yeah, like, yeah. you know, younger blues, it's obviously names like Gerard and, and Carragher. Yeah, yeah. And you go further back, and you get and you get different names. You get like Jimmy Case and different names popping up. I think yeah. um, when it comes to kind of hay figures, Gerard is kind of he seems he's... to kind of he does something amongst Evertonians, irrespective of age. So he's the one who really kind of sticks out. But it's uh, yeah, it's interesting because everyone yeah. you, you, you kind of you, you form this kind of emotional. A relationship with a player that you don't like mm. and it's very strong and it's kind of it's it's weird how it, it when you form it can dictate how it, how it lasts and that kind of stuff but it's a it's an interesting conversation to have with Evertonians I think it is weird isn't it how we do have that like that hate figure but and like you say it, it it does something I think Steven Gerrard do you think because he was such a good player as well 
it made it it made it work because he's got that you, you know he's a cop eight and all that and wore an Everton kit as a kid or whatever whatever that means but he was such a good footballer but he also had that snide didn't he and he had that the light of scoring against us and he always seemed to drag them through big games against us even when I've got to say some of the worst Liverpool teams I've ever seen yet yeah. he still managed to get one over on Everton and it, uh, invariably it was him who dragged them through it so do you think it is that has you know transcended across different ages of Evertonians because it, he was such a good footballer as well yeah I think that definitely plays a part and I think it's you know not being hated, it's a fine line to walk. Some <laughs> Liverpool players have kind of done it. I don't think Gerard made any attempt to even try and kind of, you know, walk no. that line. He, he, from the very start, he, it was clear. Yeah, he yeah, hated yeah. Him. So <laughs> that kind of, yeah, I think, I think it's a case of he didn't try. There were those moments when he dragged them through. And also, yeah, I think often when they're good players, there's always the elements of, Jesus, they hate them and they're also good as well. You know? Yeah, that, that gives it that little extra bit of petrol, doesn't yeah. it, on the fire. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the good stuff, Oh, sorry. Now let's stick with the bad stuff first. What other, what other kind of things can we find in that? Obviously, you talked about relegation. Um, is the relegation battles in there? Have you, have you covered any of them? Because they're obviously massively depressing. Has it been managers? Has it just been players who just weren't good? Has it been those moments in semi-finals, Sylvan Distan moments? Have any of them got into the book, or, or were they up for discussion, even if they didn't make it in the book? I think pretty much all those things that you've mentioned are mm. in the book. We've got like our, <laughs> our, our kind of worst eleven plays in the Premier League. We've got um, give us one, kind of of, very- give us one of them, Jim. Don't give you obviously don't give your stuff away, but give us one of them who made it into that worst eleven. Just one name. Right. Same again. It's, it, it dictates by age, but yeah. uh, Brett Angel. Oh. One that kind of poor Brett. Line. Poor Brett gets dragged into everything. <laughs> he does, but I think <laughs> he's kind of, he's a bad player. I think at a tough time. So yeah, he kind yeah, of. Yeah. For a lot of Evertonians, he almost kind of symbolised that kind of those dark years, the nineties. So uh, him, him from kind of the past, and I think yeah. recently because it's fresh in the memory, people talk about Morpe and uh, Sandro Ramirez because they're, they're kind of <sighs> more they're more current times, yeah, so they yeah. get mentioned quite a lot. Whether they'll be the same in twenty years' time, yeah. Brett Angel seems to really kind of stick in the mind. So uh, and he was, he's, he was he's the poster so. boy. He's the poster boy. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sadly. he was awful. But, mm. Yeah, but I think um, yeah, all all those moments are in there. Um, they kind of the, the relegation escapes are weird, I think, because they're obviously mm. very dark moments. But actually, you know, for fans who were there, they're huge emotional mm. times where it's not quite celebration, is it? But it's kind of relief and a yeah. bit of happiness. So it's not it's not as dark as say going down in the fifties and, mm. and, and the and the twenties. But it's um, so they're there. The times when we were relegated are there as well. Yeah, yeah. I think you have to include, alongside the great managers we've had, you have to include people like Walker and Benitez and Lampard and kind of the, mm. you know, the really poor managers that, that we've had in our history, which unfortunately that there have been quite a few, especially in in, in recent years. Yeah, I mean, some terrible. I'm a bit harsh putting Frank in there, I think. But Rafa, def- <laughs> Rafa definitely, because yeah, Rafa yeah. was Rafa was universally the most. The manager that nobody wanted, did they? No, yeah. you know, or, yeah. or very few people were were dancing for joy when we got Rafa Benitez. Let's be honest, and it it, it did represent a dark, a yeah. dark bit of our our history, didn't it? Yeah, I think that there's a, um, the, the Norwich game, isn't it? When he was caught sort of smiling as Norwich were kind of beating us. I think there's a, there's a moment there. I think a lot a lot of Evertonians feel that that's the moment that they felt most disconnected from the club in mm. kind of their. Everton life, where not only did you feel Everton were awful on the pitch, but you had in charge somebody you you just had no affinity with, and it no. felt like a, almost like an insult mm. that he was that he being put there by a, what felt like a really callous board at the time. So I mean that's a really dark mm. moment in uh, in our modern history. Again, I think that you've got to include because it, it plays a part in forming the modern Evertonian as well. No, I think you're spot on there because it is that that is the you know with Lampard it. I think most Evertonians liked them, but it just it yeah. was it wasn't working, and and you always felt like he hundred percent wanted to get it right, but it just yeah. wasn't do it wasn't happening. Even like like Marco Silva, I mean, I still I still think Everton probably jumped you know jumped the gun a little bit with Marco Silva, and he's doing great now with Fulham. Yeah. But he, you'd always felt he wanted to get it. He was like trying to get it right. He almost looked like little boy lost at the end yeah. of his reign. But Rafa. 
Rafa just had still had that arrogance, didn't he? Even in that Norwich game, they were bottom, they were dreadful. They haven't won for about three months. And he still had that arrogance going into that yeah. game and around that game. And I think you're right, those those shots of him smirking oh. did did make you think he's defo, he's defo come here to try and get us relegated. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't the case, but that's certainly how it no, felt. You can feel it, can't you? <laughs> um flipping from that to the good stuff. Obviously, Everton have had a lot of good stuff in the history. Uh, it's a long time now since we've had real good stuff, but picking those moments, was that a difficult task? Because, every, like you said, everyone will go, well, people who you speak to, that should be in there, that should be in there. How do you how do you whittle that process down? Is it, did you did you test it with people and go, what do you think? Or did you just say, look, this seems to be where a lot of the uh, consensus of opinion is, and I'll go with that? Well, I mean, luckily I'd written kind of Everton's greatest game, so I had yeah, kind of yeah. a handle on kind of the... the and there are certain moments you've got to include there. You've got to have Bayern in there. Yeah, yeah. You've got to have the league titles in there, the FA yeah. Cup wins. Uh, and you also get kind of just, just moments within those things, like the mm. um, like the Man U 5-0, where it yeah. just seems to capture something special. Yeah. Uh, but I think Bayern's the one. When, when, mm. when you talk to any Evertonian of a certain age, it was kind of around the time, they say there's something, there's just something magical about... Mm that night and what that night kind of what what it meant for the club and what it meant for the fan base so it's um really that i find um kind of whittling down the um the, the kind of the good moments uh almost less enjoyable than the kind of bad moments really, really? Because, yeah I, I think because i don't know there's, there's almost like, like a perverse joy in kind of going through the dark moments and um Whereas you know when everyone's kind of happy, maybe it's not as enjoyable. But um, as you said, you know there are lots of great moments from our past, mm. and it is it is nice to kind of when I've been writing this to kind of you know because the last few years haven't been easy for Evertonians, so it's a nice reminder sometimes to go back and you and you often you forget just how massive a club Everton has been and kind of how how much success we've had and how we've always been in amongst the bottom a few seasons here and there we've gone down and maybe the last about 20, 25 years. We've always been part of the, of the conversation at the top, and it's mm. um, it's easy to forget that when like they get belittled in the press and things mm. haven't been great on and off the pitch. But actually, you know, from football's foundation, Everton not a big deal. Is that for someone like yourself when you when you are like researching it again? And, and I know, like you've said, you've obviously got the greatest games and you've done the other stuff as well, the number nines, which is a, an iconic thing with Everton, isn't it? A yeah. huge thing with Everton Football Club. Why Aruna Kone was ever given it, I will never know, and I still fume <laughs> over it. Um, and the highs, lows, and back. Having all of that, all of that research, knowledge in your brain, anyway, as well as obviously being an Evertonian and knowing a lot of this stuff, anyway. Does it reiterate to you that what has gone on in the last few years and the way we have kind of slipped down that pecking order, does it kind of reiterate how big Everton are and does it drive a frustration in you that like we are where we are at the moment? Do you know what I mean, given given our history? And I know you can't just stay on history, but Everton's history is huge. And until Manchester City win the league this season... They've still only won as many titles as Everton has yeah. been as good as what they've been in recent times. So does does it do that for you, or is that already stored anyway? Just how big Everton are? Um, yeah, I think. Well, I think the frustration is definitely there because you, you, I think you, when you kind of look at the vast span, you sort of you realise, yeah, how Everton just sort of took their eye off the ball. Everton mm. were kind of always part, as I said, always part of the elite. Always kind of you know winning trophies each decade, and you know pretty much, and um, or, or in the hunt for things, and then you have got this this drop off. From around, well, I guess from the birth of the Premier League onwards, and we've really, mm-hmm. um, as a club, taken our eye off the ball and slipped behind. And it's frustrating because you think, will we ever get back what we had? It seems unlikely. Even if things recover <laughs> and we get new ground, and we, you know, get a better financial footing, are we ever going to be what we were in the twenties, thirties, sixties, you know, seventies, eighties? And you think, yeah, probably not. Mm-hmm. And it's, it is. It's, it's quite sad because. Mm-hmm. Whilst we are a fantastic club with a storied history, and I'm sure we'll win a trophy again, mm. that you know, just because everyone wins trophies at some point, you know, theoretically, um, you, you get that horrible feeling that it's never going to be like it was, and it's um, and you can look at there are multiple reasons why, but from mm. the fundamental, it just seem like quite sloppy as a football club. Yeah. Whereas our, our former peers have raced ahead. Yeah, and it is incredibly frustrating. That frustration has always been there. I think I've always been aware, but aware of it. But the more you dive into our past, you realise that it's 
you know, we've had this magical history and it, you feel like, unfortunately, it's just going to be history from now on. Mm-hmm. I think the thing as well, I mean, there's, there's two parts to me next bit for you. But I mean, one of them is Everton of all, I've never, if you when you go back historically, Everton have never really built and created the dynasty. After we've, we've been very successful in our history. We've won league title. You know, when when the Premier League started, Everton was still the second, had won the league the second most times, I think, after Liverpool. Um, well, certainly went last time Liverpool won there before the COVID one, the last league title he won in 1990. I think Everton was second on nine prem- uh, on nine league championships and, and obviously was surpassed by the likes of Arsenal and stuff since then, United. But So we've never really built on success. I think a lot of people are, who you talk to who are much older than me, because obviously I can, as a kid I can remember the 80s, it was amazing. But before then people said, well, when we won it in 70, we didn't build on it. When we won it in the 60s, we didn't build on it and stuff like that. That's the first thing. We've never really... We never created that dynasty, and maybe we could have done in the eighties without the European ban and everything yeah. else. But also on on top of that, I think your point is is really important. Is that when you look back at our history, and then you think, can we do that again? I actually think there's zero chance of it. We may yeah. get a seat. Listen, Aston Villa are flying right now. They've had a tremendous year. They're probably for me the team of twenty twenty three. And I know that seems. A bit mad to say because City were unbelievable and won all in trophies and City were, but I expect City to be there. I think Villa are only second to Manchester City in points accumulated in 2023. So they've been incredible. They could have a Leicester City year this year. I'm not saying they will, and, they, and I still think Man City will win it. And Liverpool are obviously right up there, but they could, they could have a Leicester City year. But I think for teams like Villa, Everton, we saw it with Leicester, we might see it with the odd other team. To be able to stay there because of yeah. the way football is now, Jim, the finances that everybody else has, it's almost impossible, isn't it? Even if they yeah. won the league this year, you well, I, I say, I don't know about, can't put words in your mouth, but I wouldn't guarantee they'd be in a title race next season or the top four. No. Because of, do you think that's just the way football's developed now with money and sponsors and, of course, the, the rules, the PSR rules in the Premier League as well? Definitely. I think they kind of, well, I think those rules are sort of preserved football and aspect. I think there's, you know, you've, you've got your elite teams now. Mm. And as you said, it, the issue is, I mean, obviously teams can have a good season mm. and a team beyond the elite can win, can win an FA Cup, they can win a League Cup, they might qualify for the Champions League, they might even win a league title, you know. But I mean, I think Leicester are a good example of that. Leicester mm. won the league and, you, you know, and, and then within what? How many seasons on their relegated? Five or something, five, five or six, yeah, they were gone, weren't they? Being consistently, I think, you know, the elite teams can make mistake after mistake after mm. mistake, as Man U have proved, and then pick it up, you know, yeah. and, still, and get back in the running. But I think for those outside, if we sort of get one chance uh, and you've got to get everything right. Mm. And even then, you've got, you've got to do it again and again and again. Yeah. And I think it's, I don't know, I don't know how clubs outside that kind of protective bubble of the the big six, how you consistently break into that mm. and then you become an elite, an elite, elite member. Yeah. I guess Newcastle is going to be a good test for that because they technically have unlimited money, mm. can't spend it freely. Will they be the one who can consistently do it because they can sort of afford to make mistakes down the line? But mm. it's, um, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's, it is, it seems impossible that Everton will ever be what we were. Mm. Um, and it, um, well, again, which is frustrating, but kind of, as you said, in our history, we have, you know, proven unable to become dominant to build a dynasty. Mm. You've been unlucky. Yeah, you, know, you yeah. can point, you can point to you know two title winning teams broken up by world wars. That's unlucky. That's weird. Yeah, uh, our greatest ever team to be broken apart by something beyond up that our neighbours did, mm. which is you know so that's three fantastic teams broken apart by events beyond our yeah. control. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, other times, like, you know, everyone thought we'd dominate the 70s after mm. winning the title then, we had this fantastic team, and then it just sort of fell apart. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, it's, there's definitely an element of, when you look at our long history, there's definitely lots of bad luck. Mm. You seem to be more, you know, more common than other teams to suffer misfortune, combined with an occasional sloppiness, which has yeah. been particularly punishing, I think, over the last 30 years, and has put us in a position now where, like every other non-elite club, 
we how do we get to the next level and i don't think any club has found a, a, an answer to that really do you think it, it is weird and obviously when you do stuff like researching for books like that it does it does freshen all of this back up when you're looking at it going god look we only went like a certain like i think when we won the fa cup in 1984 it was the longest period, was it, that we'd gone for a certain yeah, amount of time where we'd won a trophy. Yeah. But we had always won trophies in every decade, haven't we? And I remember, like, the 2009 FA Cup, everyone was like, yeah, we're defo going to win it because we win a trophy every <laughs> decade. And yeah. and obviously we lost on that occasion. And, and we have had near misses, haven't we? We had the 09 FA Cup final. We, we lost in semi-finals in the... the 2010s if you want to call it yeah. that and we have had opportunities to sustain that throughout our history keep that record going it's gone now but when you look back and you see those moments of um the moments where we've we have won stuff and haven't built on it or whatever and then you do come to this period in time now Jim where it's the longest we've we've gone yeah. I think in our history without a trophy you do look at how poorly we've been run. And I don't mean that from a, a perspective of it's been terrible ever since we won the FA Cup. Because I think, I think, without giving Bill Kenknight loads of credit and, and the board at that time before Machiri, they simply didn't have the money. Should they have sold and got other people in? Of course he should have done, because once he realised it wasn't happening for him and he didn't have the finances, he should have actively gone and pursued it. But even in that times, we have... We have totally taken our eye off the ball, haven't we, since we won the last FA Cup and Farad Mashiri come in with a different MO but then didn't listen to experts. And that is, we've probably taken our eye off the ball, made terrible decisions, haven't wanted to embrace the modern game enough at the time when it's been the most damaging, I think, because this is the yeah. first real period in time where state-owned football clubs are in the Premier League now and we've fallen so far behind because of really poor off-field decision-making. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, I think that's yeah, that's totally true. That's, that's exactly kind of... I think you can... Not just the kind of now, I think mm. you can go back to the 90s mm. and say that like we sort of... You know, we got... Uh, we got When, when uh, Peter Johnson came in the 90s, yeah. it was sort of like ill-suited to how football was changing then. Yeah. You kind of... A, a local multimillionaire as people were getting really wealthy owners mm. uh, and then we get the billionaire when people are getting state-owned yeah. owners so yeah. yeah and i think we've yeah we've we've made bad decisions over the past i'd say maybe since the, the early 90s and unfortunately it's been the worst time in football's history to make bad decisions yeah you, you could yeah. you could get away with it in the 60s and the 50s and the, the gap between the really well-off clubs and the rest wasn't that big mm. now if you if you mess up now and you don't make the, the right commercial decisions got the right owners the right people in, in place the kind of how damaging it can be to your, your kind of the, the, the level you can compete at has never been so dramatic no. so yeah we've i think that's exactly right we've made terrible decisions and been kind of sloppy and taken out of the ball and being really punished for it because that's just the nature of modern football it'll, mm. it'll really punish you uh, horribly if you mess up now mm. and um you can get into all kinds of problems if you don't run a club properly uh I'd imagine there's a lot of clubs who would look at Everton now and think that if you want an example of how not to run a football club, <laughs> you, if you suddenly come into money at any point, we're a perfect template of what decisions not to make. Mm. So um, at least we've given football that, I suppose. If not, if we haven't given them success, we've given them a horrible example of, kind of how not to run us. Horrible example, and we've given teams a blueprint how to be successful. Just do, yeah. instead of that famous quote, what would the Everton board do as a positive? <laughs> use that for, you know, use that yeah. and flip it. Do the opposite yeah. to what Everton's board would have done. Um, just very briefly before we finish, what what's your feeling right now with how things are going in terms of, because obviously, you know, I don't know whether this made it into your book, but obviously being the the first club ever to be hit with a a, a ten point deduction in the Premier League, the most severe punishment. Um, but we are still in the fight, aren't we? We're, we're still, you know, we might get some of them points back. You never know. I mean, there is there is a little bit of a groundswell. I think that Everton will get some of the points back. I think people are kind of going now. They'll get they'll get some back because they it was so harsh. Uh, what? Two things. What do you think about the job Sean Dyche is doing at the minute? 
And two, how do you think we'll do overall this season? Because right now we are very much part of a relegation battle yeah. when really we should be, we should really be all saying we might be in a, a fight for a European conference yeah. place here. So, so they're the two-part question for you. How, how do you think Sean Dyke has done so far and, and that, what do you think this season will bring for Everton? I think Dyke is doing, I mean, bear in mind the context mm. of what he kind of inherited and what's happened, as he calls it, the, the noise and that kind yeah. of stuff. Um, I think he's done a good job. I think yeah. he's turned us into a kind of relatively m- mediocre mid-table team, which mm-hmm. actually, you know, this time last year, we'd have taken that. Yeah. So I think he's... And he's got us playing... There seems to be a blueprint there, mm-hmm. which we haven't had for a, a while. Mm-hmm. The signings seem to make sense. Um, football's not always the best, but, like, you know, I think I can I can live with that. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of coherence about Everton that mm-hmm. I've, we've not had for a, a long time. And, you know, he might not be the answer forever, but I think for right now, he's certainly providing something that, that we need. And yeah. I think he, he gets the fight we're in. He understands that. Um. I feel, you feel like something's happening at Everton, which hasn't been the case for ages. So, mm. in that terms, I'm, I'm quite happy with uh, with what he's been doing. Yeah, I I think we'll get something back. I think I think the Premier League's gone hard, thinking there'll be an appeal. They'll knock a few off, and everyone can go. Oh well, you know, take that. It's fair yeah. enough. And yeah. Go. Uh, and I, you know, I still think we're gonna be part of the allegation fight for a while. Mm. I mean, if the points don't get brought back, it'll be. The rest of the season. If we do, we m- might not achieve like escape velocity for a few months. But yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I feel really, I feel more confident right now than I did this time last season. Yeah, yeah. When kind of we were coming out the um, the World Cup and uh, the side looked awful and didn't trust the manager. And yeah, things didn't seem good. I feel like we're of those teams at the bottom. We're one of the best positions to mm. get out of it. Uh, just like a few more teams kind of sucked into the fight. I think, yeah. You know, it's nice that Brentford have been sucked into it. Mm. Hopefully Forest will remain it. You just kind of, you want like about seven or eight teams. Yeah, definitely. I think if that's the case, if they start pulling away from us, because now we've got hard fixtures, then it becomes a different problem. But I think oh, right sure. now, I would back Everton to get out of it, which is technically that's optimism, which is unusual for Nevertonian. <laughs> but like, um, I just feel, I just feel like the manager, the squad, the team, yeah. the way we're playing, the feel about the club at the moment. Mm. I think there's something feels better than it was under Lampard. Feels better than it was under under Benitez. And yeah. So I'm not happy because you know you, you very very are a blue, but I'm no. not completely despondent, which is kind of progress of sorts, I guess. Oh, absolutely, yeah. certainly the way the last couple of seasons have gone, it's uh, it does feel a lot different. And, and like we said, without the points deduction, we'd be looking at we'd all be sleeping a lot better anyway, and we'd all, we'd be looking at. You know, can we catch the teams above us? Yeah. Like, you know, last night at the time of recording West Ham and Brighton drew, we'd be going, that's a cracking result, that because yeah. they're not too far ahead. That's yeah. just the way it is, isn't it? Na- yeah. The nature of it is the year we get, the manager gets a grip of it and we, we sort of start looking like a better side. We get 10 points taken off us. Of Maybe that can go in the next book. Yeah. Um, are we the greatest escape? Um, tell us then, Jim, where can we get hold of your book? Okay, so at the moment it's only available on Amazon, but okay. um, I'm talking to the Everton Health Society to maybe get some copies in St. Luke's uh, Excellent. as well. Excellent. So people go and check it out. It is called Everything You Wanted to Know About Everton, but we're afraid to ask. It'll give you a nice refresher on what a big club Everton are. And if you're looking, if you're watching this and you want to learn a bit more about Everton, maybe than overseas, Bloom, you must want that little bit more history and a little bit more context to things and why we hate Stephen Gerrard and things like that, then make sure you check out uh, Jim's book on Amazon. It's With it being on Amazon, means you can get it anywhere, no matter where you are. So get on and get that ordered. Jim, listen, thanks very much, mate, for uh, taking time to have a chat with us want to wish you all the best with uh, this book and let's hope your next book is talking about the comeback of the sleeping giants um, as Sean Dykes turns it round and carries us off to silverware and uh, a brighter future at Everton New Stadium thanks very much for joining us Jim cheers thanks for having me no problem. Listen, like I said, check out that book. We'll put a link in the description where you can just go straight to Amazon to get it. Make sure you leave your comments. Give us maybe your 
most hated uh, players, rivals. Don't put 100 in, just put like three or four in. And uh, your best Everton players. And um, maybe Jim can check the comments at some of them and see whether he's missed out a few uh, <laughs> obvious choices. Subscribe, like, do all of that good stuff. Share, make sure you share Jim's book as well. Jim, where can we find you on social media? Hey, mostly on Twitter at Jim underscore Keoghan. We'll put that in the link as well. Check that out as well. Thanks for joining us. See you later.